Hey everyone, and welcome back to Clara's Chronicles, where today is boring, so let's get exploring. I found this crazy article that I wanted to read to everyone today. I've been telling all of my family and friends, granted, this is a terrible story, and I feel very bad for everyone involved, but when I came across this, I thought, oh my god, this is such a crazy story. So I'll go ahead and start. So the title of this story is Set Steel Trap in Pine Tree Post Office to Catch the Girl He Loves. And it goes on and says, But impetuous Mr. Cattergood's strange venture resulted in a gruesome tragedy and disaster. Okay, we'll go ahead and start now. So just to sum this up, it's a lover story of these two people that were in love and, uh, you know, there's always jealousy involved, so something terrible happens. So let's go ahead and start. Halfway between Maryville and Arco in northwest Missouri stands a weather-beaten pine tree, the bowl of which is many times larger in circumference than the biggest man in the community can span his gangling arms. In this tree is a hole which resembles that made by an animal whose slow process of gnawing has succeeded in accomplishing his purpose. As a human being, with the same amount of pluck and determination could accomplish something much more worthwhile. A man can bury his arm in this hole to the shoulder. Moreover, it is pitch dark inside the tree. Certainly, there isn't another pine anywhere near that would so nicely serve the purpose of a pair of imaginative young lovers as this ancient pine bowl. Forbidden by irate parents to see one another, they, this boy and girl, wrote their passionate love letters and left them in the old post office pine. Bertha Clay and Tom Dodge were the only children in the Clay and Dodge feud, which covered approximately 20 years and which was brought about when Bascom Clay borrowed a pair of store scales from Timothy Dodge, which he lost and refused to replace. These able-bodied colored men had met under the spreading branches of the friendly pine and fought it out, the fight beginning at dawn and lasting until noon. Neither man ever wholly withstood the telling effects of this remarkable, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that's a remarkable, memorable battle, and it had resulted in an approximate draw. Bascom Clay and Timothy Dodge never spoke again. Bascom Clay thought the world of his daughter, who was like a bronze statue. And there isn't much doubt about the filial affection T Timothy Dodge had for his son. But the lovers had begun to openly demonstrate their love when the families were upon the best of terms. So it wasn't reasonable to expect them to let the family disagreements interfere with the dictates of their healthy young hearts. However, when Bascom Clay discovered that Bertha was reciprocating the affections of his hated enemy son, he promptly prohibited further meeting up, meetings up on pain of death to the boy. But the comedy girl had a mind of her own, as did young Dodge. They agreed to write letters and leave them in the hollow pine tree. Now entered an obtrusive, unobtrusively a third party, making the well-known eternal triangle in this affair of young hearts. The young Darrell Cattergood was jealous of Tom Dodge and spied upon the lovers. His own suit with the lovely Betha had resulted unsuccessfully. He was, perhaps, the better looking of the two boys. Dodge was smaller of build and shorter of stature. Cattergood, tall like a bronze god. But Cattergood, Cattergood learned that you can't force a woman to love you, even if you look like a movie star, if her heart is satisfied in her regard for another. Darrell watched them, worshipping Betha from a distance. He saw her face in the sun, the moon, and every twinkling star. She was reflected in the brook, the water at the mill dam, the moss-covered wheel, the pansies growing in his mother's yard, even in the clear blue of the summer skies. 
On the long, lonesome trail to Maryville, Missouri, he often saw her in cleared places where there was nothing save sunshine. He was a youth hopelessly and tragically in love, and it's difficult to disillusion lovesick youth. I'm sure we can all agree on that. In any case, he watched the lovers, carefully noticed that it was Dodge who usually appeared first with his letter, and laid a little plan of his own. He bought the biggest and best steel trap that money would buy, and he hid it in the hollow tree. Oh my god. <laughs> then he arose with the metallic splendor of the brassy sun and camouflaging himself in the wild blackberry bushes, he watched for the show he had managed for his sole entertainment. He had located himself about a hundred yards from the pine, but he felt like a poacher on sacred love ground. All was set for the tragedy, but the best laid plans of mice and men go astray. It happened that on the morning Cattergood set the powerful trap, Dodge became suddenly ill with fever, and Betha appeared first at the post office in time to thrust her arm into the letterbox before Cattergood, running in her direction, could scream out a warning. The steel sang its sinister song with a, when the jaws closed upon the innocent victim's encroaching arm. A wild cry of pain followed. Ah! A beating and a floundering for freedom. The arm was caught near the elbow and the girl held there helpless against the weather-beaten pine, huddled in a swoon, the imprisoned arm holding her upright. Cattergood, frightened, bent over the motionless form of the girl he loved. He released her from the trap and, loading her across his big shoulder, started for her father's cabin, leaving a crimson trail in his wake. When he reached his destination, the girl was dead. She had bled to death. Immediately after this, Daryl Cattergood vanished. The folk residing in the vicinity of the antiquated pine contend that the timber is haunted. Some claim to have seen his ghost walking through the woods as though carrying the invisible body of Betha Clay. Oh my god, this story is just, it's a terrible story and it's sad, but wow, isn't that a wild lover's tale? I thought everyone would enjoy this. It's, it's intense. Um, and I just wanted to go back to the first page. At first, I thought this girl was Betha, but I have learned since reading that it is Lavana Fisher, beautiful and talented dancer of, the nor of Northwest Missouri who composed an interpretive dance based on the strange incidents surrounding the Clay murder. Creating an atmosphere of supernatural reality, this unusual dancer has gained renown for her original score on the ghost murder of Pine Tree. So here she is. Here's the home of the Clay family. Pretty Betha Clay lived here when the gruesome tragedy occurred. Wow, this is just a crazy, crazy story. If you'd like to read this on your own, you can find it in the Richmond Planet newspaper. Um, it's the edition from November 22nd, 1930, and you can find it on chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. There will be a link in the description. Well, I hope you enjoyed this story. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it. And I will be back to share more stories like this. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I will get back to as many as I can. All right, all have a great day and I will see you next time.